Today on Airborne, SpaceX's Grasshopper leaps tall buildings in a single bound. Seaplanes are welcome again in New Mexico, and Gulfstream delivers the first G650. I'm Ashley Hale, welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. SpaceX's Grasshopper took a 12-story leap towards full and rapid rocket reusability in a test flight conducted December 17th at SpaceX's rocket development facility in McGregor, Texas. Grasshopper, which is SpaceX's vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, rose 131 feet, which is the equivalent of a 12-story building. It hovered and landed safely on the pad using closed-loop thrust vector and throttle control. The total test duration was 29 seconds. This flight marks a significant increase over the height and length of hover of Grasshopper's previous test flights. In September, Grasshopper flew to 6 feet, and in November it flew to 17.7 feet, or about two stories. SpaceX's ultimate goal is to verify the Grasshopper's RLV's ability to perform a VTVL mission at higher altitudes and higher ascent and descent speeds. To achieve this, the maximum mission test altitude would be increased to 11,500 feet. The maximum test duration will be approximately 160 seconds. To succeed, the Grasshopper RLV will land back on the launch pad. Testing of Grasshopper will continue with successively more sophisticated flights expected over the next several months. Score one for grassroots advocacy. The state of New Mexico, which had proposed a general ban on amphibious aircraft and seaplanes from all of its state parks, relented following an effort spearheaded in part by the Seaplane Forum Online. The state had proposed a rule that would have amounted to a complete ban on seaplane operations of any kind in state parks citing safety concerns as well as a potential problem with invasive species being introduced into the state park's waters by landing airplanes. The prospect was vigorously opposed by recreation pilots, not only in New Mexico, but around the country. A few days before Christmas, Jason Baker, the owner and editor of the forum, forwarded a communication to ANN he'd received from the state of New Mexico that says in part, quote, Based upon the comments received, and given that the Bureau of Reclamation and United States Army Corps of Engineers already have regulations addressing seaplanes and floatplanes, the state did not adopt the proposed rule." End quote. The decision reflects the efforts of everyone who contacted the state of New Mexico to express their opposition to the proposed ban. In short, chalk one up for the good guys. The first fully outfitted ultra-large cabin, ultra-long-range Gulfstream G650 has been delivered to its new owner, a U.S. customer. This important first delivery came just hours after Gulfstream Aerospace Corporation received two important certifications for its new flagship aircraft. The company received the production certificate from the FAA Atlanta Manufacturing Inspection District Office and also earned a type certificate for the airplane from EASA on December 20th and December 21st, respectively. Gulfstream recently announced enhanced performance characteristics for the G650, including more range. The G650 can now travel 6,000 nautical miles at its high-speed cruise of 0.90 Mach. This is a 1,000 nautical mile increase over the original target of 5,000 nautical miles. Spaceship 2 recently undertook its first glide test flight in its powered flight configuration, meaning with rocket motor components installed, including tanks. It was also the first flight with thermal protection applied to the spaceship's leading edges. It followed an equally successful test flight earlier, which saw Spaceship 2 fly in this configuration, but remain mated to its White Knight 2 carrier aircraft. All objectives of both flights were successfully met. Spaceship 2 is expected to undertake a minimum of two more glide flights in order to complete all remaining preparation for its first powered flight. Spaceship 2 will be powered by a hybrid rocket motor. 
This type of system is not a new idea, but offers important safety and environmental advantages over liquid or solid systems that are more commonly used on manned space vehicles. In particular, it means that the pilots will be able to shut down the Spaceship 2 rocket motor at any time during its operation and glide safely back to the runway. America's seaplane city, Tavares, Florida, hopes to gain wider recognition of its official brand. And with Progressive Aerodyne manufacturing the popular Sea Ray amphibious airplane on the shores of Lake Dora, they may have moved a step closer towards that goal. Sea Ray, which won classification as an LSA from the FAA back in November, will be joined in Central Florida by Italico Aviation USA, which will build LSAs in Kissimmee, Florida, and Whip Air plans a service center in Leesburg. The city has already rebranded itself to reflect the importance of seaplanes to the local economy, having established a seaplane base in 2010 that has seen an estimated 3,400 landings over the past two years. Now, the Orlando Sentinel reports that the city thinks that the Sea Ray manufacturing facility will be a catalyst for additional economic recovery, not only for Tavares, but the entire region. City Administrator John Drury said that over the next three to five years, he expects that a seaplane cottage industry will grow up around Tavares, attracting not only aviation, but other businesses to the region. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature rich advanced aviation training device priced with real world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, send us an email to news by at aero news.net. Well, the same ForeFlight mobile app used for flight planning and in route navigation is now available for Lockheed Martin's Prepared Simulation software. Prepared is a visual simulation platform that allows users to create training scenarios across aviation, maritime, and ground domains. Users can train anywhere in the virtual world, from underwater to suborbital space. ForeFlight Mobile is an app used by pilots and flight operators to gather pre-flight weather information, plan flights, conduct pre-flight research, file flight plans, and keep in-route charts and terminal procedures up to date. With FSX Flight as the interface, prepared aircraft position information is sent to ForeFlight's mobile app, providing a moving map electronic flight bag. With this app, the user can use the ForeFlight mobile moving map display aircraft position on taxi diagrams, and display aircraft position on select approach plates. The interface requires the download of FSX Flight to connect prepared to the ForeFlight mobile app. Since when does slowing something down help it go faster? Well, that's the part of the picture being studied in a slow to rotor proof of concept project at Carter Aviation. During performance flight testing in November, the POC aircraft flew with the rotor slowed to 106 RPM. The company says that by significantly slowing the rotor's RPM to less than half that of a comparably sized helicopter, the aircraft demonstrated a lift to drag value of 12. That's around two and a half times better than the most efficient helicopters. 
Carter Aviation Technologies says they expect the POC aircraft to achieve speeds in excess of 200 knots at 25,000 feet and 350 horsepower with the current test weight of 3,950 pounds. Additionally, the POC has proven its VTOL capability. Achieve speeds in excess of 140 knots on 200 horsepower and an altitude of 12,000 feet. The POC aircraft is a variant of the company's four passenger vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the four place PAV. Version 6.9 of Wing X Pro 7 has been released by Hilton Software of Parkland, Florida. The new version includes three significant enhancements, including smart taxi, search and rescue grids, and search patterns. And it's the first iPad app to support the dual XGPS 170 Bluetooth ADSB receiver. Smart Taxi is a patented technology developed by Hilton Software. It was initially introduced several years ago on the Wing X Windows mobile solution. Smart Taxi has been enhanced to take advantage of the iPhone iPad platform, and it's now enabled at over 4,000 airports. When the aircraft is on a near runway, the entire runway is highlighted in red or yellow, respectively, on the airport diagram. In addition, Wing X Pro 7 additionally displays the runway identifiers for takeoff and displays the distance remaining in real time. Version 6.9 significantly expands its search and rescue functionality by adding SAR grids and patterns. Both are fully compatible with Wing X Pro 7 track up and split screen features. Wing X Pro 7 version 6.9 is a free update on the App Store and iTunes. In this week's barnstorming commentary, ANN CEO Jim Campbell shares with us one problem that needs attention in the coming year. Thanks, Ashley, and Happy New Year, folks. Well, we talked a little bit last week about just kind of filling out the end of the year, but there's going to be a number of agenda items ANN is going to be pushing for pretty heavily next year based on the stories that we've done, the knowledge that we've gained, the insight that we receive on a daily basis from our readers, listeners, and viewers. But there's one thing that lays below a number of the complaints and problems that we have in aviation. And that's very simply this. We have no better business bureau. You've heard about the fights that we've gotten into to try to stand up for the folks who are the customers, the, uh, the, the buyers of products, the users of services who haven't necessarily always gotten what they paid for. And in a couple of particular cases, they've gotten really screwed by those who they thought they could depend on. The problem is this, the, uh, the associations have never had any guts to stand up to uh, somebody who ultimately you know, uh, is a sponsor or pays them ad dollars for their magazines or whatever the case. We've been the only ones that have been uh, stupid enough or gutsy enough, depending on how you look at it, to do those kind of things. But there's complaint after complaint after complaint about how some people are being treated by those who are either not ethical or not qualified to deliver what they promised. And the fact of the matter ultimately is this, we're losing people. We lose them day by day. They disappear, they become disgruntled, they become disillusioned, they become distrusting of aviation. And why? Because aviation wasn't good enough to be trusted in their cases. They worked with companies or products or people who simply just didn't or wouldn't deliver uh, what they had promised. But there's no place to go. In the real world, there's a better business bureau. In some cases, maybe an aviator could go there, but they'd be ill-equipped to really understand the rudiments and, and technologies that we're dealing with. The associations, as I said, won't do anything about it, and we really don't have a place to go. And if it's just us, uh, I think we do a good job, but we're one voice, and we're a limited voice in that there's just 24 hours in a day and 365 days in a year and just so much we can do. There needs to be some place where an aviator or an aviation oriented person who has bought a product or service or in some cases done some kind of commercial business and not gotten what they paid for, where they can go to complain, to help get help, to alert others to this kind of thing. And so far there isn't. How would we build that? Where would it come from? Who would do it? These are really good questions and some questions we want to answer in the coming year. But more important, what do you think? 
where do you go when you have a problem in aviation outside of just your buddies and the message boards and of course a and there's got to be a better way we need to look for it and i'd love to see something get put in place next year what do you think for the aero news network aero tv and of course airborne i'm jim campbell and once again happy new year we really need a happy new year well nasa has been taking some pretty big pr heads for its lack of a manned space program, and with the shift towards the development of commercial space companies, maybe it's time for them to pick up the slack. We can't be sure why, but during the most recent test flight of SpaceX's Grasshopper, a six-foot dummy cowboy was strapped to the rocket and taken for a ride. The Blaze reports it was all in a bit of fun, and perhaps to provide some visual perspective of the rocket's actual size. Whatever the reason, it gives new meaning to the words in Willie Nelson's hit song, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Well, that's our program. Remember, there will not be an Airborne episode next Tuesday, January 1st, as of course we'll be observing New Year's Day. But we will of course return on Friday, January 4th, 2013. In the meantime, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. I'm Ashley Hale. Have a safe and enjoyable holiday, and we'll see you next year.